Thanks, Matt. Um, so, my name is Johanna Lemaire. Actually, got that on my second slide. If we can manage to click there. Yeah, there we go. I'm Johanna. I'm here tonight because I love data visualization. Um, it's been part of my job for for my whole career, I guess. And I've recently done this deep dive into Tableau and best practices of data visualization. So I do come from a different side of things, not from data data science and not from the machine learning side, but I'm um, always interested in learning things. And as a business analyst, I, I like looking at the whole process around defining what to measure, how to measure it, and and then communicating the results. And yeah, you can find me on Twitter or at Gmail. And thank you for the opportunity to let me um, present here. As I said, I'm not a data scientist, so, uh, but also the competition that I wanted to look at tonight is, is not a data science competition per se, it's a Kaggle competition, but it's a judged competition. And the data is about data science scientists because it's the 2019 Kaggle survey data and it's about telling a story. The 34 questions, not all 34 questions were shown to every participant in the survey. And almost 20,000 people responded. And yeah, as Bruce said before, please do interrupt with any questions, um, jump in. I am doing this on a small laptop screen. Um, so I think I'll need the help of the hosts of the meetup for, for questions in the chat or because I'm, I'm not sure I'll see them. I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, the you said that not every uh, question or not everybody that was asked the same questions. Did they? Did you read any bit about like why they wouldn't ask everybody the same questions? I did not. They they did share the um, a file about that, but I did not go into depth about that. It certainly makes it more challenging. There is quite a bit that makes this challenging. It's <laughs> it's also the other thing that makes it challenging is the um, select all that apply survey question. Um, yeah, because of course, um, how are you gonna, there's a total that's more than 100%. So yeah, it's it's interesting that way. Okay. Links are here, so you can find them later. The competition, um, I think, yeah, the competition ended four months ago. It ran for a month. Prize money was $30,000, split across five prizes plus one early, early submission prize. And it was a judged competition. You had to submit a notebook with a data story around a subset of the survey data. And the judging criteria were the composition, so the flow of the story, originality, what new insight are we getting from, from this story, and the documentation of the data manipulation and what what you did in order to get to the insight. Um, again, coming from the Tableau side of things, where there are quite a few competitions as well, um, those competitions tend to emphasize the design aspect of things and not so much the documentation aspect so I thought this was interesting in that context. 
the data. So looking at the questions, 34 questions, age, gender, country of where you currently reside. There's no data on country of origin um, or nationality. Highest level of education, job title, size of company, number of people responsible for data science workloads at your place of business. Um, does your current employer incorporate machine learning methods into their business? Activities that make up an important part of your role at work. Select all that apply. Current yearly compensation, knowing that everyone was supposed to estimate that in US dollars, and knowing also that this question was actually not presented to the student population. So that's the one thing, Matt, going back to your question that I that I found about the which questions were presented to who. How much money have you spent on machine learning and or cloud computing products at your work in the past five years? Again, the questions like that I find are interesting together with that previous question about like how many people are responsible, for, sorry, for data science workload, the question number seven. Depending on the size of your organization, your response to that is going to be very approximate, like say someone who works at Amazon. Um, versus someone who work, who has their own company like like Bruce. So it's it's not only that we have we have some data quality <laughs> issues there if you want in terms of the person's own perception. Favorite media sources that report on data science topics, number 12. Oh, sorry, I uh, jumped, uh, skipped one. No, I didn't. Um, primary tool that you work to analyze data. How long have you been writing code to analyze data? Integrated development environments, which ones do you use? Which hosted notebook products do you use? What program languages do you use? And question 19, interesting one right there for all, all of you who, who said you wanted to get into data science, which program lang programming language would you recommend an aspiring data scientist learn? Um, surprise, most people said Python. Um, <laughs> what data visualization libraries or tools do you use? Which types of specialized hardware do you use? Have you ever used a tensor processing unit? How many years have you used machine learning? Which machine learning algorithms do you use? Which categories of machine learning tools do you use? Computer vision methods, natural language processing, machine learning frameworks, cloud computing platforms, cloud computing products, Big data slash analytics products, machine learning products, automated machine learning, and relational database products. So overall, there, there are a few questions around demographics, a few questions around workplace, and a lot of questions around tools. And the uh, data was presented in four comma-separated comma files. The, um, the survey schema, like the fourth one here, is the one that goes into which question was presented to who. And the questions only is just what it says. It, it just literally gives question number and question text. The other text res responses is they for to anonymize, sorry, to make the data anonymous, anonymous they uh, 
they um, jumbled up the the uh, other text, the long text responses, so they can't be be linked back to individuals based on their um, demographics. And the the first file is is the file with most of the answers with those 246 columns because questions with select all that apply are spread out over the number of columns, number of choices. Okay. And that brings us to the official report by Kaggle. So let me just switch to, oh, sorry, to a different tab in Chrome. Here we go. All right, so what this is, is the official corporate style, I want to say, report that Kaggle um, made about its own survey. It's, it doesn't cover all the questions. It provides a few bar, bar charts and it, a few bullet points with key insights, things like how many people have responded? Only 21% of the 19,717 Kaggle members who replied are say that they are currently employed as a data scientist. Um, yes. Yeah, a quick question here. So, sorry, we're reading that. Does that mean that they were they only took into account the people that said that they were data scientists, or no, I, no, okay. For this report, yes. So oh, okay. the content of this report focuses on respondents who are currently employed and chose their current job title as data scientist. The full data and the data that was the uh, basis for the competition included people who are students and people with job titles like business analyst, like um, database engineer, like um, developer engineer. Um, but this specific report, they decided to only look at that subset of, of people who who say they are a data scientist and who are currently employed. Okay, and, and was this report given to the contestants of this competition? Like, was this provided before the competition? Yes, this was oh. available before. Yeah. This is, I have a question that's maybe not best to be debated, but I'd be curious to know what their choice was. Is a machine learning engineer a data scientist? Um, so, I have a, it, it strikes me as a, a job title that would obviously not match the query equals equals data scientist, but for the purposes of Kaggle, I would like to think that, you know, are you a Kaggler and also employed doing Kaggle-ish things, then it should be a true, you know what I mean? So, um, I, I know what you mean, and I... Because I'm so familiar with Tableau, I made my own Tableau workbook to be able to, to look at a few data things quickly, except that the resolution is totally messed up right now because I was looking at this on an external screen before. And also, heads up, my phone alarm just let me know that in about a half a second, we'll all hear a lot of noise for all the people out there on the front lines. Okay, let's see. Tableau desktop. Um, I'm just have a look at the uh, the uh, multiple choice options for job title because that was um, those choices were were given, and there was a little bit of um, other text, but most uh, most people fell into one of the things um, suggested. All right. I'm going to get my answer in real time. This is awesome. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, um, I was just, uh, how is this rendering on, on your end of things? Uh, when I tested this with, it's in our house. Um, 
my in-house person, my my dear child, that it was extremely laggy. Is it okay on your side? I think it's coming through okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good. So employment title. Most people are students. And then we have data scientists next. And then we have software engineers. Do you see where I'm? I'm down here. Um, data analyst is something different from a data scientist. A research scientist is something different from a data scientist. Business analyst. Of course, we have the people who, who set something else. We have people who did not answer, and we have people who are not employed. Product or product project managers, data engineers, statisticians, and we also have database engineers who are different from data engineers. So, yeah, to come back to your question or your, your comment, Alex, say it's those categories. Hmm. <laughs> like you can get it many ways, and also the other thing is like for any any one of even us in a small group of twenty people, when you have one job title, that doesn't really mean that you necessarily do the same things on a day to day basis, right? Yeah, thanks. So I guess it's conceivably group put under other or uh, like people may have put themselves under other or they may have called themselves a data scientist. I still think like, I don't know, I think a very interesting question would have been like, do you Kaggle for a living, essentially? And I guess they didn't really ask that. So we don't really know. Oh, you, are there people who Kaggle for a living? Well, actually, sorry. Yeah, there are, in fact, some people who Kaggle for a living, uh, either because they work for uh, employers that want certain behavior and results out of Kaggle, or there are a few people who actually win enough prize money that they do it for a living. I didn't really mean literally Kaggle for a living so much as I meant, like, you know, like, I mean, a well, well, I, I think a well-run machine learning project looks a lot like a Kaggle competition. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, I thought the other interesting thing here in this Tableau book, um, I mean, one of the key insights that they, in the, in the Kaggle report, um, is, is true over all the 20,000 Kagglers. Most of them are male. Um, for data scientists, it's true. As, it's even more true. Um, the... One thing that surprised me is that actually worldwide, most Kagglers currently live in India. And only second most live in the States. And in India, most people are students, most Kagglers. And they make a lot less money than people in the States. I just click back to the states. The states people make most money, and there are more data scientists than there are students. I'm um, I'm not sure you you saw that how the age changed from India to the states. Um, Kagglers in India are younger than than in the states. And anyone want to know about Canada? Yeah, no? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. Canada. Uh -huh. So most people in Canada work in something different. <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> Data scientist is way down there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there's only, sorry, sorry, this is, so, how many people? Only five data scientists <laughs> in Canada. So you know who you are. <laughs> so yeah, four in 50 people responded to currently, or at the time of, of the survey, which was in October 2019, um, lived in, were living in Canada, right? And I think in terms of male, female, 
slightly better across Canada than it is across the data scientist population worldwide. And when I say better, I mean um, more even. I mean, it's it's just horribly unbalanced overall. It's it's, it's like the big takeaway in terms of gender. Um, the other big takeaway is that um, is in terms of age and, and there again I think it's it's one of those things where we get to the limit of what kind of insight this this Kaggle survey has about people who work in data in general because does it mean that overall people who work in data are younger or does it mean overall people who work in data and are on Kaggle <laughs> are younger right like it's it's not the same thing obviously any other things that you want me me to click on so, so we can have other insights on this page sure i'm curious um if you click on student what what's the proportion in the gender is are we improving oh Question. So this is now going to be student in Canada because I still have the Canada filter active. Oh, it's better. Neat. A third. Yeah. So I'm curious of what that looks like worldwide. And of course, computer science course classes are notoriously bad for this. So I think if you consider ML data science as a computer science-y thing. I think these numbers outperform those breakdowns for sure. Great. Well, the, the thing here is I'm, I'm really surprised by this, like how, well, positively surprised. We're better in Canada in terms of our student population. There's uh, more gender equality in, in this, in the data student population here than, than worldwide. Well, but that's that's still a, a really small number. So mm. two or three people choosing or not choosing to answer would would make a huge difference there. Right. How many do we have? We have a thousand people. Yeah. Oh, I, I was thinking of Canada, where where you had five, five, yeah. you know, fifteen students all together, and and five five were were female. But you know, two two or three, one way or the, or the other, choosing or not choosing to answer, just throws that off yeah no totally any other cuts on slices on here and as you can see there's no data for yearly compensation as long as we've got the um, students um, selected because they were not asked In terms of size of the company, I uh, so it's <laughs> I find it interesting. Um, how big is the company? More than ten thousand employees is is big, and um, sort of like more people, most people not employed, <laughs> and more people towards the extremes of these choices. Um, and yeah, same thing for how many people at work are in, in data science. It's either, either more than 20 or less than a handful. Okay. Um, yeah. So in terms of that, I think I'll, I'll just stick with this for one sec. The other thing that I was looking at here is machine. When I'm sharing my screen, do you see my obnoxious zoom bar in the middle in front of everything or not? No, the zoom bars don't show in the sharing. Okay, good. Um, so the other thing that I put into this Tableau dash 
dashboard kind of format is the um, machine learning and coding. This will tie in with um, the winning notebook, so stay tuned. How many years have you used machine learning methods? So we see that the uh, majority of Kagglers um, have, have very little experience with machine learning methods. Also, the majority of Kagglers have very little experience with writing code to analyze data. So I guess that means that a lot of people who responded and who are on Kaggle use Kaggle to learn, just like us, yay. Um, and next, next one here, how do I go to the next one? Here, yeah. education. So most Kagglers have, uh, have masters or higher degrees. Um, that this is this is true across all countries. Um, the thing is that uh, this question did not distinguish between has has that degree or um, plans to have that complete that degree within the next two years. So this also includes the current students who are all route to get their PhD, their masters, and their bachelors. All right, back to the slides here. Report by Cattle. Um, here, presentation view. There we go. So, yeah, one of a few, just key. Key bar charts from the Kaggle report, male, female, um, and the the age distribution schools have way to the younger people and where people live. Well, mostly, very mostly in India and the states, and then more in Western Europe than anywhere else. Okay, so the first place winner. The, um, the topic of the first place winner of this competition is who codes what and, and for how long. Second, third and fourth place were won by, second was a network analysis of the PhD community, how, how are people interconnected. Third place was how, how do Kagglers com compare to, the, to the, the skills and the tools that Kagglers said they use in the surveys, how does that, of course, compare to job offers, job postings on Glassdoor? The fourth one was looking at Japan and the rise of women data scientists in Japan. And place five was, is spending money on data science worth it in terms of what salary you would be able to obtain with skills learned from spending money. So here she is, the winner of a first, first prize. Her name is Teresa. She is living in Zurich, or she's still living in Zurich. She's a freelancer, identifies as a, as a data scientist. And as you can see, she's not ranked in, in Kaggle. And uh, she's, she's, um, this is her first competition, well, no, her second competition because the one competition is the active competition that she was participating in when um, I took this screenshot. And the, the other teams place two, 
three, four, and five, well, teams. Only the second place was a team of two people. Place three, four, and five were also solo competitors. The second place was won by people who were totally new to the Kaggle platform. Places three, four, and five had some standing on the Kaggle platform, but um, this is, yeah, again, this is not your typical competition where people with a high rank come out on top. Oop, wrong way. I wanted to go here and um, look into, into her notebook. I'm not sure I said this before, but the competition required that entrants would submit a notebook. And this is from the uh, reasoning of why she won first prize with her notebook. She groups the responses, responses according to experience with writing code and using machine learning methods and the heat map visualizations were a very effective storytelling tool. So let's have a look and see if you agree. All right. I think if I put this on full screen, you might be able to see more. There. Better? Yep, yeah, it's good. Um, so, notebook, she first with all this hidden code, she is importing the normal standard libraries. I actually am proud to say that I now understand the very basics of uh, pandas and seaborn and uh, matplotlib. So, yay me, um, <laughs> I've gone beyond writing simple loops in Python to actually being able to write very, very simple um, visualization notebooks. So, uh, <laughs> so for anyone who's thinking about, you know, presenting um, as a newbie, this is, this is indeed an excellent way to force yourself to learn something new. Um, so, in terms of looking at this notebook, I thought it was interesting to look at how the criteria of the competition, well, the flow of the data, but also the, uh, and the originality, but also the um, having to document what you do, how does that compare to your typical um, corporate dashboard? Um, like what kind of audience do you would this be good for in terms of if you had to communicate what you did um right so let's dive in who codes what and how long a story told through a heat map um so for those of you who speak german um, um just for info my First language is German. This is a very little literal translation from a German <laughs> sentence or title. Um, so she says, this is not a story of a group of people. It's a story of one heat map. And she doesn't like bar plots. She likes heat maps. So it'll be a heat map. And um, she takes those two questions that I showed you earlier of how long have you been writing code and for how many years have you used machine learning methods? So further standard bar charts. Now comes the problem with the multiple choice as it was presented um, in the um, in the survey and I, I thought there was this was funny because having worked with real-life survey data this is so real life <laughs> the two the, the number of categories don't match between these two questions um, also there is there's a, 
a gap in uh, the orange question, the question 23. We have 10 to 15 years at the very end, and we have more than 20 years. But what about people who have used machine learning methods for 17 years? Anyway, um, it's just, so what she does next is that she, she aggregates the, um, the, category, the um, categories here to, to have them match like the two, three years she puts with the one and two years and the three, four years she puts with the four to five years um, to make both of these questions um, to, to be able to, to match them in this um, table, right? And now comes the rest of her analysis where Oh, and um, going back, the the thing that is great um, compared to somebody doing all that work behind a dashboard and only showing the results is that she actually says, okay, that's not the same, but one problem are the, the bins. Unfortunately, responses have not been made equal. Granular bins, I aggregate the answers. So she really just describes exactly what she's going to do. Um, the, uh, all right, so now comes the, uh, let's look at the, let's look at this um, table of how these two questions relate. And over half of the respondents have less than two years experience with both with machine learning and with writing code to analyze to analyze codes and and then the the bigger frame here with the 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 red frame is for 75 percent have less than five years total um and all right, let's look at what it looks like in terms of where people are coming from. So she she's now making other other groups of people in terms of diagonals, people who come from the machine learning side, people who come from the coding side, or people who code and machine learn sort of at the same time during their careers, uh, which is the majority. But a close runner up are people who come from, from the developers side of things. Which, I mean, to me makes a lot of sense. How, how would you be able to, to do machine learning without programming? It maybe I don't know enough, but with these amazing single click auto ML uh, cloud services, he said very sarcastically. Yeah. You've been doing it for 20 years as well. <laughs> Great. So, um, so, yeah, even though I don't know much, I know that that doesn't have, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be very promising. <laughs> right. Um, so, so now she she goes on to say, okay, let's let's make groups, knowing that they're, you know, this isn't, this is obviously not any sort of these are groups, but sort of like, okay, I think I can potentially put them in groups and call them that. Um, very arbitrary which again is, is what you do with survey data. Uh, the, you know, in terms of data visualization and best practices, because that's just, that is, happens to be one of the things that I dove in very deeply over the last few months. One of the things that I found interesting in this, in, in this notebook, was that the number of colors used here, the, um, 
there we have green we have red we have orange i mean these are colors that color palettes that come with seaborn um but you can certainly modify them um before that we have purple and green and some light beigey beigey yellowy color so one of the best practices uh, is always being pointed out in all like how to do data visualization test your colors for compatibility is there enough contrast is there is there uh, is it is it still distinguishable for people who have some sort of um, color weakness? And I'm not so sure. I didn't actually put this notebook through through the tests to the test websites, but things like using um, the outline here for for the for the arrow and the the call out say. In my opinion, aren't quite as pretty as they could be, but again, like we're working within the limits of the notebook. Any comments or thoughts on that? Can, can I just raise my hand and ask around? Um, so I very briefly looked at this kind of stuff, but I'm aware that Google has uh, something that you can just pass a website through. Are, are you yeah. aware of like a simple way of just sort of is my color palette? Sort of is is it sort of you know color blind friendly? Is it these sort of other other things? Um, if I printed it in black and white, uh, is it going to look okay? That kind of thing. Is there are there any good resources you're aware of that, that, that will do that quite simply? So I have. I'm aware of a website. Let me just get rid of my Zoom bar here. There we go. Um, so color scheme. That's not the one. There's something that I would use called Color Brewer. It's not what Mike's asking for, but uh, Color Brewer comes with these sort of template. The palettes. Pre-prepared palettes that like, will give you a certain number of categories and divergent or uh, like nominal color mappings. And they, they'll give you ones that are color brine friendly and so on. So um, that's what I've used in the past to sort of just by design have it be no, have it satisfy those goals. So the the one that I use all the time is this one, the accessible colors. Um, it does not do what Mike just asked for. It's um, it does test contrast, right? So which so in the case of this data story, we could test how. This, this contrast of this light beigey color on the white background, is that accessible enough or not? And it would then suggest a different contrast ratio. Um, but where is the color blindness thing? I've been using, oh, I thought I just can't remember where I put hey, it. Hey, hey, Mike. You're using R right now, so there's actually an R package for this called Colorblind R. Uh, I don't know of a Python version of that though, okay. but it does exactly what you're you're talking about, where uh, you just uh, you wrap uh, whatever visual visualization you're doing, and it'll give you like a faceted view of the different types of color blindness. I'll post the link in the chat. Is it this one, the call blind door? No. Sorry, I'll I'll look for it later. I I think I remember where I put put my bookmark. Um, I don't want you put to put you guys through through more searching. <laughs> um, Is anyone here, has anyone here a color weakness? The other thing that I learned is, uh, is uh, actually, I was used to think it's only, it's only males, but there's also, there's also prevalence amongst the female population. No one? 
think it's something like four percent or something overall like males and females um all right chapter two after sorry any other questions comments up to here okay chapter two of her oh, of her um notebook using the heat map as a tool to generate further at inside so what she does first of all is to to go to a, a simpler gray gray degrees color scale and she then normalizes normalizes the um from uh, overall response numbers to out of a hundred percentage right and then she compares it to other questions. So we have um, the responses to question number five, which was, what is your current role or most recent role, like job title? She compares to students and data scientists. and. Um, she then goes on and says well to just compare it like that is is going to be very tedious and first of all we can see that amongst the students it's in up in up in the top top left corner so few years of experience with either machine learning or coding and of course people who are data scientists have more experience so so now comes the uh, the um, the big innovative way of uh, visualizing things that she comes up with here and that sort of goes on through the rest of her story is that she says well what if i subtract one from the other and now i have in the overall in the data scientist population compared to the overall population um, with the the deeper the red the means that this group has fewer people in the data in the data scientist population have low levels of experience and more people in the data scientists populations you know according to the blue have longer longer experience um, and this is how she then goes on with that red and blue color scheme which is actually one of the um, recommended talk going back to color accessibility questions like one of the things that they tell you to do is never use green and red always use either orange and blue or red and blue but never green and red together so uh, what's good and now comes the application of this innovative thing here and uh, goes through a number of questions so first job title and education so i this is quite small probably on your screens as well um what happens if i zoom in here does it work or not really not really eh? okay sorry, sorry can we can we take a second and just go through that again what the different colors mean sure just to wrap my head around it a little bit better yeah sorry um okay so here, where is her example? So starting here, um, on the left side with the 22% of people who have, um, or maybe we should start further up to 
Well, I, I don't want to go over the same stuff again, just but maybe as we're going through the actual questions, I, uh -huh. I, I, you're probably going to do this anyways, actually. Just, yeah, I'm not sure I fully wrap my head around what the gr what the red and the blue represent, but if you can just kind of reiterate that part as we're going through the questions. Yeah, so just, just here is her explanation of what she's doing. She's taking the percentages of of data scientists, let's start with that number six here. Six percent of data scientists have zero years of machine learning and zero years of coding experience. In the overall Kaggle population or survey respondents, it's 22 percent. She does six minus 22 and gets to whatever that is minus 14 or something um and the anything bigger than my well smaller than minus five percent percent or percentage points sorry is is a dark red meaning that fewer fewer data scientists have that level of experience than overall Kagglers. I hope. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm hearing this wasn't wasn't that helpful. No, 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 no. That was that was helpful. Yeah, this is the part that, I, that I'm looking forward to seeing. So, like analyzing this. Right. So job titles. Um, so the one that we just looked at was the data scientist right here and um, we can contrast the data scientist squares or square full of squares with the students so what it, what what basically both of these look like inverses of each other we have a top left corner for the data scientists, that dark reddish, meaning that there are fewer data scientists in the top left corner who are who have little machine learning experience and little to none coding experience than in the overall respondents. But there are a lot more um, data scientists who have long, long years of experience in machine learning, which is on, on the horizontal axis, and coding, which is on the vertical axis. And, and the students are just the opposite. There are fewer students, so red, than um, as a fewer of than in the overall respondents to have long long years of experience in either coding or machine learning and and more students so blue up here in the in the top left corner. Uh, who are the people with very very little experience? So basically, if one if the distribution in one sub question matches exactly the distribution across all all respondents, we're expecting to see a totally white square. And only the differences will show up in red and blue. Does that make more sense? Yeah, that's, that sounds good. Okay. Yeah, so in terms of differences between the different um, job titles here, um, business analysts, data analysts, and software engineers tend to have experience in coding and overall little experience in machine learning. So the way we would see that is that on, 
on the horizontal axis, we have the machine learning. So when we look at the data analyst here, less data analysts are, are anywhere in, in the machine learning side of things, but, but um, more, more people have coding experience with this, which is the blue. Um, people with more, more machine learning ex experience would be fur further to the right on, on the horizontal axis a blue. So the research scientists have machine learning, more machine learning ex experience than overall Kaglers, the so do the st statisticians and the data scientists and all well then the students are overall overall have little experience so do the non-employed <laughs> and on the others are sort of some well sort of all over the place there are people with lots of coding experience in there database engineers and have similar profiles to data engineers um yeah but i think that's something we said at the very beginning those two roles are so dependent on what the title is in a particular organization rather than actually being necessarily totally different roles. Um, data scientists are in the middle, two to ten years of experience coding and machine learning. And yeah, the research scientists and the statisticians are the machine learning veterans. And the statist statisticians also do a lot of coding. Right, and um, the difference between data scientists and research scientists may be reflecting the historical reasons, but it all, may also be the application oriented role of the data scientist. Mainly, you don't need someone with 20 years of machine learning experience to build a deployable recommender system. There you go. Yes. Highest level of formal education again with uh, the heat map. So people with PhDs have more, so blue, more experience in machine learning and in coding. People with Bachelor's degrees tend to have fewer, few years of experience. And um, people who don't want to answer are all over the place. People with master's degrees have some more, a few years more of experience. And the professional degree is sort of I think more heavily skewed toward the years of coding. And no, no formal education past high school is interestingly enough all over the place. So we have people with many years, more, more people with many years of machine learning experience here than in the overall Kaggle respondents. Yeah, so again, um, this is the pattern that is clear and not surprising, almost disappointingly. Um, <laughs> I thought this was interesting. I wonder how these distributions would look like in a few years from now. Well, the people with bachelor's degrees who don't pursue a master's or PhD 
advance in their machine learning experience or will they get stuck in non-machine learning related ex activities? Um, what do you guys think? Is it, is it necessary to have a master's or a PhD to, to do machine learning at work? I can chime in here. I don't think it's necessary to do a master's degree in these days. In fact, when I took my master's degree, I, I had been already studying machine learning for a year. Uh, I'd started this meetup before then, and I was just very disappointed by what I learned in my master's degree. I didn't really learn much of anything. I didn't really expand my machine learning knowledge at all. But yeah, I'm curious what other people experienced too. But you got more employable. I got way more employable, yeah. And so because I'm employable, I do get to practice ML more. And would I still have the same motivation if I wasn't making money? Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Would you be working in the job that you're in if you didn't have it just on a recruitment basis? Yeah, yeah probably not. Definitely not at Boeing. Did, did you have a different master's degree before or was this your first... No, that, that was the only master's degree that I have. I think I think one factor is that uh, companies are doing less machine learning than they say they're doing in a lot of ways. So they they might hire a, a bunch of people who do machine learning, but then uh, put put them on other things because they're not really doing as much machine learning as they anticipated doing or hoped they were doing, things like that. Yeah, also true at Boeing, probably. I think um, maybe another way of asking like this kind of question is like, is this a steady state or not? Like, and we think we probably know it, it's not, right? So, like, one of the reasons why there's all these people in say the like top left corner of these charts is because they invented machine learning and then they invented machine learning courses and then people took them and they started getting jobs to do that in the workplace and so on. And so does that bulge like move from the top left to the bottom right? Or do those people like exit the field, you know, or do they, do they move into management? Like does the, the demand for ML get fed by all these people and then we stop hiring students because there's, you know, like, so those are maybe interesting questions that I don't have an answer to. Yeah. And do we need, are we going to need less machine learning experts because it's going to be drag and drop automated online <laughs> tools that, that allow all of us to use machine learning without understanding a lot of, about it? I think that uh, there'll be a little bit of that going on, but there'll be room for expertise. But it's also, I think the characteristic of the field of modern machine learning is that it is very modern and it isn't that deep in a way. Uh, you can be, plus the resources to teach yourself are like spectacular. Yeah. So people who have some sort of raw capability can jump in and learn a lot about it and be doing very leading edge kind of work pretty quickly. Uh, and I guess I'd sort of put myself in that category. I mean, I, I have a PhD in mathematics from 100 years ago, but I, I don't have any formal education in machine learning. It's, it's really all self-taught through these meetups and, and other things. And I feel I can, I can kind of keep up when I need to. Yeah, to chime in similarly, like I have a quantitative background, but basically no formal education in predictive modeling. And I think I'm very good at predictive modeling. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's important maybe to have like a good foundation. That's where oh. what Bruce alludes to is some sort of raw capability of some sort that you got from somewhere. And maybe that was formal education. Uh, but I wouldn't pay anyone at a boot camp or a university to teach me ML. Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, except it's, having a master's degree is really great on your CV and might well, be worth the time and money. There is the issue of, yeah, how do you get objective evidence for the fact that you can do it? Um, I encourage people to do Kaggle meetups. <laughs> uh, not meetups, sorry, but Kaggle competitions. Uh, right, actually. right, right. Uh, you know, you get a few of those. You don't have to be in the top, whatever, top three and win the money, just a, a couple of bronze medals or something. Somebody, Anybody can do that and know something about what they're doing. 
Yeah. So real quick, Jana, just be aware of time. I think we're moving pretty fast here. Uh, yeah, maybe 10 minutes. Great. Um, so in terms of further insights of, of this generated from this, this notebook, the winning notebook, I, I, I actually didn't think that a lot of that she goes through a number of other questions here um, in the same way with always this, this sort of analysis. Um, there isn't a lot that really is surprising in terms of insight here. Um, in terms of originality of what of what she, of what she has done here, um, I think the originality is really in. Um, sorry, scrolling all the way down to this is actually how how do people how do people learn um, <laughs> on which platform have you begun and or completed data science courses? <laughs> um, so this goes to, to the um, fact of um, there are so many tools to, to learn. There, there, there are so many, so many people who use Coursera and Kaggle and things like Data Camp um Udacity, Udemy, whatever you name it. Um and there are also university courses that result in a university degree. Uh, <laughs> um the um people who who do take the university courses are are more more further along in their journey into machine learning than other people or who've taken those. Um, and then sources of information, where, where do you get your information about machine learning, about data science? Do you use blogs, um, forums, hackneys, journal publications, um, Kaggle forums? Do you do nothing at all? So the, I thought that the thing about nothing at all was interesting because those tend to be people who have tend to be a lot more people who have very little experience in machine learning. <laughs> so if you do want to get good at machine learning, you better learn how, well, you better apply yourself at learning. Um, hey, just a quick shout out to the reading group. It looks like a lot of experienced ML practitioners are reading journals, whereas people starting out are not. So maybe that's a sign. Yeah. And there is no big like um, the these are the overall um, things that you know big um, conclusion of of the winning notebook. Um, I, I think that what what is really great in this notebook is is the flow of the story of how she sort of goes about and, and really it's it's written in a very converse, conversational tone. Oh, so I looked at these two questions and I thought to myself, years of coding and years of machine learning, aren't those the same? Oh, no, they're not the same. Okay, let's look at them. Okay, and then I wanted to compare it to other questions. Like, she, she really, like, it flows really nicely. And the way she comes up with this unique um, visualization with the blue and red and, and the difference in the distribution is, is very interesting. Um, the, the thing that I'm like wondering in terms of how applicable is this to, to real life, it's very, in terms of the judging criteria of the competition, it's very well documented. She explains exactly what she does with the data in order to get it in shape so she can compare it in, in, in that way. Um, she she explains why she chooses different um you know she chooses to only show color in the in those little heat map comparisons rather than showing numbers um to make it more more easily and quickly readable um 
is it more easily and quickly understandable for a typical audience of these are the survey results um i i have my doubts um i think bar charts <laughs> and and things like that tableau dashboard is is more easily for most people is it more easily understandable once you like made the effort of reading where she's coming from and, and sort of all of us have all of us here have a quantitative background and have some sort of mathematics engineering science um statistics formal training and or machine learning expertise um i don't know i i thought it was interesting interesting questions to throw out there how like would it make sense for for anyone in their work in order to share survey results to use a notebook rather than a dashboard or rather than you know presentation slides thoughts Well, I mean, being able to add the descriptions is definitely nice to do, right? But is there ways of doing that within Tableau? I, I'm not sure. Well, in Tableau, you can add all sorts of, of free text, um, right? So we go back to my Tableau. Um, I could put all sorts of text uh, fields on, in the middle of here and say, this is how I did this, or this is how I did, they, they did that. Um, but, uh, you know, if if I do add, it, it's less, in, in, in a notebook, it's just more the flow of the notebook, like what you usually do in a notebook. You write a bit of markdown text and, and then you put your code and it's, it sort of forces you into that format and um, in, in Tableau and similar tools that are made for data visualization, the whole data manipulation part tends to be hidden from the user you can click your way to finding that but it's it's not what those tools are are made for right also in terms of i skipped uh, over a few uh, slides right there and uh, i wanted to go in the third place winner is actually, in addition to having his competition notebook, he also published a notebook on how to win a data visualization Kaga competition and sort of explained why he thinks that he plays so well. And uh, he said, well, um, I use these radar charts and they are so innovative and so different and I mean, case in point, Teresa used heat maps, which aren't maybe as little used as the radar charts, but there she definitely came up with an original way of, of showing that difference in distribution with the, the color gradient. Um, in real life, I, I don't usually think that innovative chart types are a good idea when you want to com communicate insights thoughts yeah well, I, agree. I i had to uh present some survey data recently and i did it in a notebook and i think it oh. would have been way better if i'd done it with tableau or something like it but i just don't know tableau <laughs> so i didn't want to go through that learning curve so I threw together my own notebook instead. Well, happy to help. You know, I'm, I'm unemployed, so I do have time on my hands. <laughs> and I do need any sort of practice I can get. <laughs> so there is, there's a free version of Tableau, right? Or public Tableau or something? Yes. Is it, is it pretty capable? Oh, yeah, it's actually the same. Um, so Tableau public, basically what it allows you to do is to save 
notebooks instead of in, in, instead of saving your Tableau workbook locally, you save it to to the Tableau public server. But it doesn't have to be public on the Tableau public server. Um, so depending on how sensitive your data is, that um, is is something to do or not to do. Um, but I mean, we are talking about yeah, you know, company confidential information here, so not for public consumption. I, I don't know how I feel about it being stored on somebody's server, even if supposedly it's not public. But yeah, right. So. Um, Tableau is the um, the full Tableau software is free for students, so that's definitely for for anyone who's currently a student. That's I consider myself a lifelong learner. <laughs> well, you know, Bruce, um, I actually am currently taking this Coursera, or hopefully. I'll, I'll, I'll get around to finally finish it um, this Coursera data visualization special specialization um, and with that class comes also the license for Tableau so it's it's not hard and fast to have to be a student in a university setting kind of student you can also be a student in a in an online Class. Cool. I'm inspired to look at it more closely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, the the thing that there, like a lot of the stuff that Tableau does, um, the there there is a lot of drag and drop. So this is, you know, um, the interface for building a a chart. As a so-called worksheet here, and you drag, you drag your dimensions and your measurements, so the n number of records, and you the question, and you can decide to instead of having this be the the gender, you saying like, well, what about? Well, I, I'd rather have a look at the age, so I just drag this on top of the other one and it switches to being different right so in terms of this it's just I, I think it's unbeatable in terms of ease of use once you get a bit the hang of it of course but um, yeah like compare it to I don't know Excel um, that a lot of people you know were not in data use this is just so fast and so easy and it produces out of the box something that's not horrible to look at whereas you know excel produces mostly horrible to look at and stuff out of the box does it have a python interface it does oh well okay i'm definitely in then it, it has a python <laughs> interface and it has an r interface um it can also um, connect to all sorts of data sources. Where are we? Um, all sorts of files, um, all sorts of different kinds of servers. Uh, so, yeah, definitely, definitely something to. And I don't even work for them. <laughs> Okay, well, we're at 8.04, and it looks like people are already dropping off, so I want to make sure that we all have a chance to thank you, Hannah, today. So if everybody could please unmute their microphones, and we'll give her a round of applause in uh, five, four, three. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you.